Uh, hello, this is Paul Quinn um, uh, from the University of Chichester Centre for Fairy Tale, Fantasy and Speculative Fictions. But this is not a recording for the Chichester Centre for Fairy Tales, Fantasy and Speculative Fictions. Um, so all opinions are, are mine and my colleague, co-host from various videos you may have seen about um, Doctor Who and weird fairy tales. Um, it's Devon and Cornwall's finest Doctor Who <laughs> and associated critic. It's Meg here. Meg, how are you? I'm good, thanks, Paul. How are you? I'm I'm fine, and that's not at all uh, awkward that we've already had that conversation. Now we've <laughs> no, it's it just totally normal. Time. This is fine. <laughs> it is entirely normal. And and today uh, we're we're going to be talking about a particular favourite of yours. I, I know that when we recorded our video about um, Jesus figures in fantasy fiction, which is available on the YouTube channel for the Chichester Centre for Fairy Tale, Fantasy, and Speculative Fictions, you should go and watch it after this one. Not long after that, there was a big big dot two announcement that you were so happy about you had to screenshot it and send it to me <laughs> and it was the return to doctor who of the incredible stephen moffat possibly new who's finest author and and meg what was what was your positive or negative reaction to this news i think it was that you asked something like you're fucking kidding me it was. I mean, and I took it to mean that you were delighted that, that Moffat had returned and, and not a showrunner. And so he'd go back to producing some of the awesome scripts he produced when he was just working for Russell T. Davis. But I, mm. I get the impression that, that you, this is about as welcome a return as the Black Death for you. So <laughs> what is the problem with Stephen Moffat, then? I hate this man, Paul. <laughs> He's my personal enemy. Um, I think... Here's the thing. I think he's a re when he's doing one-offs, I think he works really well. Like, I think he has some great pieces of, like, one-offs. Um, but I I just detest him. And it's not... <laughs> it's his writing. I'm sure he's a great person. His writing, not only in Doctor Who, but in a lot of other things, also reflects, like, awful stuff. Like, I think there's just this pattern of sexism and these story arcs that he's too over-ambitious with and he never actually finishes. And they make some of the seasons and some of the like arts borderline unwatchable because you have to think of so many things going on at once and none of them lead to the same thing like none of them connect properly are you suggesting that the wedding of river song isn't one of the greatest <laughs> pieces of doctor who not just the last 20 years but of the last 60 years i am i'm implying that maybe that one was a was an oopsies <laughs> I mean, I know there are people who would be kicking around uh, Hamps of the Blunt Penknife who would agree with you wholeheartedly about Wedding of River Song. I mean, again, that's that's a that's an episode people should go and listen to on Hamps of the Blunt Penknife. It's not me speaking, so it's not self publicity. Where it's a very long discussion about what's wrong with that particular episode. I'm not sure it's right, but I think this issue about the arcs probably there is something to the arc in season six that goes very very badly wrong. Yeah. See, I grew up. On Matt Smith, I'm a Matt Smith fan. Like mm -hmm. I don't want to be Matt like he's awesome. Matt Smith is I, awesome. I think he's sick. He he's like my second favorite Doctor. I think he's really cool. Yeah, uh, it um, might be old people watching. It. So by sick you mean good? Good. I think it's a very good Doctor. I think he's rad. There you go. Um, and I I love him. Radical. <laughs> radical. He's radical. Sorry, fool. <laughs> but. I just, I think the arcs are really half assed I think he's so, he's got so much confidence. I mean, the crack in the wall, all of that. And it's not, but it's never a part of the actual linear narrative. It's always just little bits chucked in, but don't have to be there. And the fact they're there kind of makes you just confused for a while. And then it takes so long to fix the issue and there's gaps in it. It just doesn't work for me. <coughs> so that's season five and season six. I mean, I I think season five is the best season of New Who. I'll be honest. Um, apart from the Silurian two part, which is terrible, um, right there in the middle of it. Uh, well, the first episode is quite good as a kind of basic budget perp we parody. Um, the second is the most boring episode of New Who. I think, apart from the very end when Rory dies and gets sucked off into the crack and then you get some incredible eye acting from um, Karen Gillan when she forgets who Rory is 
But I think that uh, the nature of the crack changes, doesn't it? I think that's right. Um, and then season six, I think it, it falls apart completely. And I think part of it problem probably is that Moffat hasn't thought through what he wants to do with that arc in terms of the, the crack, because the, the business about the voice and the TARDIS in The Big Bang, which is a great dual entendre for a episode title, because, you know, it's The Big Bang, but it's also Rory and Amy shagging. But as I've discussed on another podcast, you can never have sex in the TARDIS. It always ends up badly for you. The fact that that voice is there and is never resolved, that tells you straight away that he hasn't thought through this mm. in terms of a second season whatsoever, even though the end of that story they go off in the TARDIS, you know, you, you think he's putting them out uh, at the end of the wedding. And, and then the fact that it, the fact that Karen Gillian is saying goodbye, Ledworth, away, he says, it's it's Amy's narrative, really, isn't it? So, yeah, you know, what pans out in this season six around the child with the, the, the terrible unresolved storyline around um, Melody River Song and like, the fact that, that she grew up with them, a character we hadn't seen before. That, let's call it the, I like bits of it. But on another level, it's dog shit. Also, Let's Kill Hitler is just an objectively weird episode. Mm. Like, just, that's just strange. The... What do you mean? I mean, I, I can I can think of the, the strangest <laughs> elements in it, but my strange may not be your strange. I just think the, the blasé attitude in which River is introduced. Yeah. It's like they're trying to make it this like big deal, but it's not a big deal, guys. This is just the plot of the episode. It was really disingenuous. Um, and also just... It's not that the acting's weird. It's just that the characters feel slightly off throughout. I think the only person written properly in it is Rory, which I think is a hot take. But I think Rory is also... But also because Rory's not a woman he gets consistent writing throughout a lot of the series. Yeah. Um, yes. Stephen Moffat, he, count your days. He 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 is a Moffat um, everyman figure, isn't he? I, I hadn't thought of that. I hadn't thought of that at all. And that, I, don't, I, I think you're onto that there. That, yeah, for a rewatch, watch, 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 watch. I mean, I think, I think, I think you're right. Matt, Matt Smith is incredible. I think that first series he gets absolutely the idea of the young man trapped in the old man's body. He's mm -hmm. some that's kind of been overlooked by fandom now for, for a while, I think. And he's probably due um, a reappraisal. I think he's all served in season six. I think that's that original um, threesome, eventually when it becomes a, a, a three in the TARDIS, I think they work really well. I think, yeah, I think you're probably right about Arthur Darvill. He is a kind of Dio, the fact that he's kind of cuckolded by Amy. Is it is a Moffat figure? It feels I think. Mm. I, obviously my opinion of Moffat is um, I think pretty much every single woman he writes is a sexual fantasy for himself. Um, I think that comes well, not necessarily for himself, but for the young male audience that he seems to think Doctor Who it has. Um, if that makes sense, because, because he's because his touchstone for the show is his sons, yeah, and you see this in interviews and like. Boys of that age are not great at plotting. But uh, that may also come for the, the huge um, emotional blind spot in season six, which is the child isn't recovered. Yeah. Um, somehow we're meant to just think what you referred to already, the revelation that River had grown up with her parents as their best friend. That's somehow meant to make it OK that the last image we have is the child regenerating on its own in the alley in New York. When Moffat could have resolved that when he sends Amy and Rory back to New York, back in time, back to the 30s, entirely possible that they meant to grow up to about 50 and then find their child and bring her up. But he just doesn't do it. There's, there's a weird kind of emotional black spot there that doesn't think, think about it. When, when I, was, I was teaching a summer school at Sussex after season six, and one of the American students was wearing Doctor Who t-shirts and I got this conversation about it. And but she was unbelievably incandescent with rage that Moffat hadn't resolved that storyline about the child. And it's a weird thing. Yeah. It is that that's just a plot device. There's, we're not meant to have any kind of emotional response to it. And yeah. I think that's what comes into play where you're saying, no, the, the, the idea that it's only boys watching this. Um, and all the women. I mean, ultimately, all the Moffat women are Linda from Prescott. 
I don't know what that means, Paul. I'm sorry. <laughs> Have you not seen Best Gang? So Mo Moffat's first big show, and there's an argument it's still his best work, is the children's program for ITV called Press Gang, which was about a, a, a um, school newspaper. Uh, Linda, um, Julia Sawalia, Safi from Absolutely Fabulous, is the editor, Linda, and she is, she is the kind of tough, no-nonsense, but with a, an emotional interior. She's that type of Moffat figure. Yeah. That, there's an argument that, and of course, when Moffat writes Curse of Fatal Death for Children in Need, Julia Sawali is playing the companion that the Doctor's going to go off and marry when you know he's brought in to essentially end the, the show. Because that's clearly one way of reading Curse of Fatal Death is all the regenerations are used up and then the Doctor can retire, which Moffat has come back to again. So there's that, uh, you, you absolutely, all the women, I think you're right, they're sexual fantasy figures, but they're also Linda. From Prescott. That's haunting all of his work. I think. Also, it's a great series. Thing, I'll, I'll trust you. Um, <laughs> although I don't know if I can get through any of more of his writing, um, but we'll see. If you say it's his best work, I'll check it out. I didn't say it. I, I, <laughs> I think probably Joe Ford from Hampstead Blunt Pen. I think okay. he's made a claim to me. I like I love Press Gang when I was growing up, and I think some you know in it. it there's an astonishing two part where you think one of them's been killed by a gunman who takes over the the, the office, and they, there's a, uh, a there's a, a child abuse storyline which just at the point at which child abuse has been acknowledged in in children's television for for older children and how you dealt with it and it's interesting how, how it's it, it's it's subtle in a way that it, we don't tend to think of Moffat in terms of subtlety, but you're kind of Jico, aren't you, as a kind of typical. Dog shit. Yeah. Like That's really your type of stone from off. I'm thinking press gang. You're thinking about his crappy attempts. Yeah. And of oh. course, in between that, you've got chalk and you've got coupling. So he's essentially a, a, a comedy writer, but he's got this seam of Doctor Who work because he, he's writing short stories for um, the, the books. But also, when you're. And thinking, then he turns up. I just think when you think of his other work, I. What the fuck is BBC Sherlock? What the fuck is that? It's terrible is what it is. I, okay, admittance, and this is embarrassing to have on the internet. I used to love that show when I was like young and it first started coming out. Because um, I, I don't have the book with me, it's at uni. I read the entirety of all the Sherlock Holmes stories when I was younger. And I really enjoyed having a more recent version. And then uh, my prefrontal lobe started developing. And I went what the fuck actually what the fuck um Irene Adler is just every single char uh, female character that Moffat has ever written uh bisexual dominatrix okay we don't need to know that about you Stephen actually um but no it's just what the fuck is that and then, then we we let that man continue with Doctor Who do we okay I, I think I mean Sherlock Sherlock the rumor was always that the pilot was unwatchable, but that can't be true because it's on the DVD release. But Sherlock was released in the August, which is never a time you put on a uh, premiere because it's always a sign you're not sure about the show. And a week before it, the BBC had released this what was maybe this big sci fi thing with Mini Driver and I think James Nesbitt and um, you know, a man that was in uh, ER who then turned up playing uh, Nikola Tesla for um oh. uh, and it was it was like a disaster it's a massive flop and so there was always a sense that well sherlock's here for a reason and the reason isn't that you think it's going to be any good so i watched it that that first night it was sunday when it's sunday sunday at half eight so again a weird time because it's an hour and a half long and i thought it's all right it's all right but i saw people getting into this kind of proximities of ecstasy about it i think no no, because if you, it's weird. So it's three episodes per season, isn't it? And in all of those seasons, at least one of those stories is an absolute dog. And if you've only got three stories, you can't afford one to be a dog. In Doc 2, 13 episodes, you can get away with a dog or two, or where you clearly budget's been sent somewhere else. But these are an hour and a half long. They shan't, shouldn't be in the state they're in. The other problem, of course, is when they try and show. Sherlock's thought processes in the first episode, it's essentially the same as how they try to show Matt Smith's thought processes in the 11th hour. And I think absolutely you're right. The fact that the two shows are running at the same time affects both those shows. 
I mean, I, I, Cumberbatch, I think, has done... Cumberbatch is, is brilliant when he does proper work. So, um, as Christopher Tegan's in Parades, it's an astonishing performance. And Patrick Melrose is one of the greatest TV performances of all time. But when he's in this, and then kind of like, oh, well, yeah, he should definitely be the next Doctor Who. That was the other big thing. And then when this was raised to me, when he didn't want to be a face on lunchboxes, and then he rocks up in the great whitewashed Doctor Strange. There's a basic hypocrisy there. Oh, yeah, yeah. You see... Because again, to teach you the long history of this, Meg, anytime there's a decent Sherlock Holmes from about 1980, fans always want them to be the Doctor. So Jeremy Brett, who's the greatest TV Sherlock Holmes of all time, they wanted him to be the Doctor. And there's something to that, but I don't think Brett would have done it. I think he would have been great, but also Brett's health, his mental and physical health, kind of collapsed while he's playing Sherlock Holmes. That there's, Sherlock Holmes essentially kills Jeremy Brett. It's not going to kill Cumberbatch. The other problem, of course, with Cumberbatch is he's got Martin Freeman as, as um, John Watson. And although Martin Freeman is good as Tim in the office, I'm not sure he works as as um, Watson. And I yeah, think... Irene Adler is a empty river. Yeah. Um, I... Yeah, it's really weird. And mm. also Mark Gattis just yeah. being his bestie and then just being like, I'll put him in anything. Like yeah. he's in um, obviously the final Capaldi episode for like no reason. And it's like, okay. Uh, he's left for Stuart's grandfather, isn't he? It's really shit like that. I yeah, mean, I they like... drop that in at the end like a big reveal. And <laughs> you're like, okay. I mean, I, I like I like Mark Gahis. I think he's a very good cultural commentator. I think the first two series of League of Gentlemen are, are two, of the, two of the best comedy show seasons of all time. His Doctor Who stuff isn't great, though. And I, I there's there's controversy because I'm I'm old enough to have read Nightshade when it was first published for New Adventures, and I always hated Nightshade, and I always will. I I think it's dog shit. Um, his best script, I think, for Doctor Who has been Crimson Horror. Yes, I agree. Uh, I and I think I think that might be the best story in season seven B. I think he, he, I like I like seven B. I don't like seven A. I think seven A five five episodes isn't enough particularly when they're just marking time till you get to a finale that's not that good. But I think Hyde's a really good story, apart from the last five minutes when it discovers that it's not the monster's just in love and it's lost its partner. No, the monster should be this killer from the end of time and yeah. going to butcher everyone. You don't need the sentimentality. And I think Crimson Horror, obviously Nightmare and Silver is a god-awful piece of shit and everyone involved with that should hang their heads in shame. Um, but I do, I do think there's stories in that that, 7b where matt smith is back on form I, I think in name of the doctor he's astonishing in that i think obviously clara is this kind of moffat fancy figure where she's ever in the doctor's timeline and it's not all the resolved. comments about her short skirts oh god yes <laughs> oh yeah i knew we were gonna go there <laughs> apparently that reference was in the original script for nightmare and silver and moffat clearly moves it back into um inside the tardis we're Clara our sex figure. Absolutely. Mm. And it's like, I mean, Jenna Coleman is awesome. I think I think she's a brilliant actress. I think they were lucky to get her. They were really lucky to get her. Some of what they're overlaying onto that carriage in terms of have a wank over I would this. have quit if I was her. No, legitimately, they're yeah. literally like, this is the part to pause if you want to like have a moment to yourself. It's like Yeah. I'm I'm pretty sure in Center of the TARDIS, which is a story fans hate, but I I I enjoy it. There's a cat, there's a there's a edit there, or there's a there's the camera catches where the skirt just flips up. I'm pretty sure that's the case. And again, it is here you go, there's a special time for you, the mm. pubescent boy watching the show, not the adults who are watching it. And so it's a weird one because so I mean I, I'm arguing there's a lot that's right here, but it is hard to get away from from your argument which I think is right, that there's an issue with the writing of the female characters across the board. I think it's... Because Amy's sometimes some type of weird sex figure, like kind of sluffish figure early on. Mm -hmm. The fact that she's a kissogram with yeah. clearly strip of... Yeah. What's that about at seven o'clock in the evening? Because there's something wrong with that man, because he's an idiot. It's, it's really interesting, because like I said earlier, Smith was my introduction to Doctor Who. So yeah. I'm 20, so he was my introduction because my dad loves Doctor Who and my mum tolerates it. And I remember we sat down and we started watching it. <laughs> She's learning to love it, ish. Yeah. Mm. Um, I remember we sat down to watch it and there were these moments where it was 
how was I like early teens and it just was my dad and my mum and I just watching tv and there was just like hey guys here's a woman in a skimpy outfit and we're gonna do a pan up from her legs so you can see her ass and we're just sat there as a family in silence like what the fuck <laughs> what's going on like we just want to eat what, our what, dinner so, so for Chris, Christmas day then for um uh, a Christmas carol which is the best Christmas special I will argue okay but it does also have the fact that they're in the home in suite playing us up to have sex. That's quite a tricky one for tea mm. time on Christmas Day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it just, mm, and because we're only a family of three as well, there's no way we mm. can have another little conversation without mm. it being very obvious of what we're doing. And it's like, yeah. I don't know how that didn't scare me off Doctor Who and the way that, how does he, because obviously his, as you said, his touchstone is for his teenage boys. Yeah. It's not just boys aren't the only teenagers. <laughs> like, yes. there's going to be girls there that are going, "Oh, this makes me feel uncomfortable." Yeah. Because, and also because that pattern of every single companion being so deeply in love with the doctor, it's like, "Oh, that's all I am then." Like, just yes. someone to pine over this man and boost his ego. Yes, and just... and to have a relationship they can't have, mm. or because of the. Yeah. So I just remembered Amy's wedding when she's like, you may definitely kiss the bride. Yeah, 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 yeah. You may absolutely definitely kiss her. And then poor Roy comes along and she says, shut up, it's my wedding. Our wedding. Our wedding. So it's a we yeah. <laughs> because, I mean, a Moffat defender go, oh, look, but that's Amy's a strong character and put in Roy's place. But actually, I, I don't think it's a, it's a fantasy figure of this it's, kind of... It's a cheating woman. Yeah. Who slaps yeah, Rory several times? Yeah, and we're is so it's a weird kind of sluggish figure that we're meant to root for, but also that she she is defined by her sex mm. and the, the potential for a relationship with the doctor. And it and it, it's a really really weird weird relationship that he establishes there, and it's a, such a shame because because yeah, you're right. R Rory is Arthur Darvill is really good. I he hasn't got much. Rory. To but he's he one of my favorite really, companions. Yeah, and and it's unusual. Really, male companion is unusual. Uh, so, I was what we had before that. Mickey is a kind companion. Dare we say his name? Jack as a companion. <laughs> but then, of course, Jack first. Jack first appears in a Moffat episode. And yeah. how far is what's going on in the Doctor Dances Moffat, or how far is it Russell T Davis? Because famously, Davis said the only persons whose scripts he didn't need to edit were were Moffat's. Which might partly explain why Robert Sherman's never been back. Paul Cornell doesn't do too much beyond that, apart from like that terrible adaptation of Human Nature, which was always an overrated book and is a really overrated story in season three. But Moffat's there from the start, and he does give—I don't know—I mean, Dalek saved season one for me. I was I was gone because I think the okay. first block is so terrible, and then Dalek comes along and you go, "Well, actually, I do want to stick with this." And even the long game, which which is a, isn't great, but if you fast forward all the scenes with Adam, actually it's it's a passable story. And I, I there is something intrinsically good about a wall of meat with teeth as a villain. And then of course it pans out. But the big one then is that two part of the empty child and the Doctor dances. So where are we with that? Maybe if, if we if we like Moffat when he's working for someone else, where are you with his his first foray into New Who? I feel like I'm flipping about on it quite a lot. Yeah. I think the, em the Empty Child, I think, is praised for something as better than it is. I think it's a good episode. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. However, do we have to do throwbacks to old episodes all the time? Like, people, like, other writers, re like, reference it back, which I don't think is great. I don't think that's particularly good. But I do like the thing of um, just this once everyone lives. Yeah. I yeah. I think Moffat specifically has a weird thing of someone has to die to make it tragic because he seems to shortcut emotions with death. Yes. And I think it's good that you can show that he can for once write things with emotion without death. But also, yeah, it's just odd to me how much people seem to be obsessed with it. Still. I mean, I think when when they were doing the promo for that first season, before we knew what had gone down with Christopher Eccleston, mm. 
Mm. And so the fact Eccleston wasn't Legendary. doing much. Legendary and, Christopher Eccleston. Oh, he's awesome, Eccleston. I, I, I really, I wasn't sure. I was, I was, I was driving for him to work when they announced it was coming back with Eccleston and Billy Piper, and I thought that's weird casting, isn't it? Because Eccleston at that mm. point kind of this idea that he was kind of this chippy figure, really intense, had a really good, but he'd walk very quickly. So he rightly left Cracker in the second season because he could see it was just a kind of. For all Cracker looks different TV at that point in time, it really is just a retread on, here's the brilliant amateur detective, here's the plodding professional detective. And Eccleston could see that because he's, a, yeah. he's such an acute reader of these roles. And so he gets written out in that really spectacularly horrible fashion. Um, and so I thought, that's a weird one. So it didn't surprise me he was gone. As it's come out, what happened or what's meant to have happened, and certainly his recent thing where he'd come back to so if they sacked Davis, Collinson, Julie Gardner, in a way that's kind of like an awesome bridge burning with anything to do with the production. And you can see Billy Piper's face when she's next to him, because like, what are you doing? Well, mm -hmm. we know why you're doing it. So when, on a rare bit of publicity, he was on the Jonathan Ross show and they showed the scene with um, Richard Wilson as Dr. Constantine, which is a great scene. You know, the whole business when he's trying, when, when they kind of diagnose what's happening here and the sonic is being used and then Richard Wilson transforms, even though the effect that's roping out, it's a, it's a genuinely great scene. Yeah. And I think because tonally season one is a bit all over the place for the first six weeks or so. I mean, Rose is one of the shoddiest pieces of television I've ever seen. I'm surprised anyone came back the, the following week. And Thank like, you, Paul. Aliens are like, I've been to say it, <laughs> Shit. The best out of those ones actually is End of the World. Yeah. By a country mile. Because even The Unquiet Dead isn't great. I mean, like, Lawrence Miles is reading that it's, it's uh, anti immigrant, which sparks a lot of twitching in fandom the following week. But it's really, really slow. So I think there's. The high points you pick up on are what you hold on to in the season. One of the high points is definitely that scene with Richard Wilson because it's so well done. Um, the whole to dance is a synonym for sex, of course. It's just indicating where Moffat's going to go when he gets the reins of it. And 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 Jack, Jack. I mean, I, I'm, I, I find it difficult because, because John Barrowman did a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of promotion of the season. Mm -hmm. And so if you listen to the commentaries on that season one box set which is a beautiful box set there's commentaries on everything i think and, and as moffitt takes over there's fewer and fewer of them barrowman's there front and center eric doesn't do any obviously because he's gone by that point and so it's such a disappointment the revelations about john barrowman dropping his cock over the shoulders of and just being such an awful person in general yeah but what's interesting is because, you know, last week or the week before, because Russell D. Davis is going to be on the wheel or he's been on it, and Barrowman put on Instagram, oh, that looks good, and, and Russell D. Davis went, it's such fun. Of course, the sky's falling on Davis because he's still friends with Barrowman, and the Barrowman defenders will come out. So it makes it quite tricky, the allegation about John Barrowman and the allegations around Noel Clark, which we have to be very careful about because, of course, he did take that case to The Guardian, does kind of put a shroud over season one and then you do look to what's the best bits in season one and it's Dalek I'd go out to bat for Father's Day I think that's a great episode and, and the end of it the um, part of the ways is, is a phenomenal episode I think and the second the end of Bad Wolf once you get all the crappy parodies of game shows and not watches anymore out of the way from the minute Billy Piper seems to have been dematerialized through to the end of that season through the end of the second episode that's an amazing set of television but i think fandom has it that moffitt's is the best story that season and it's very difficult to, to move that because there, there's there's some good moments in it i think yeah everybody lives but again it's pointless to the fact that moffitt will kill all his companions but won't let them die i am still angry no about word. bill Potts. i think about bill but that's so often episode. Because because yeah, season ten is very different to what's gone before, and we've got to do eight and nine. But here we are at the start of Moffat's one. We can see at the time we didn't know it, but now you can look back and you can see major tropes that Moffat is going to keep coming back to are there in that that first two episodes. I mean, what about um, Girl on the Fireplace, which has undergone a major revision in fandom? I've noticed recently. Has it? Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, amongst certain corners of it. I, I, I mean, I'm not just saying because I really <laughs> reverse my position on it. I think it's now a really creepy, pedotastic episode. Um, Please elaborate on that before I share my opinion. 
because you know there was an original plan that the doctor would have been trying to make rose into the perfect companion so that business about that he left her the bike he was santa claus and there was a feeling no it's a bit grooming so we'll leave it the fact that the doctor keeps dropping into um renette's life from a child to an adult and she kind of falls in love with him it's a bit wrong now <laughs> amy pond um Amy, exactly. <laughs> and again, how far we can see what Moffat's going to do in a longer run is already there in, in his first two stories. Uh, I think the Cotter Rose are beautiful. I don't think they need to come back in deep breath. I think that was that was kind of lazy and self-reflective and exactly the type of referral back that you're talking about. But uh, it's a it's a weird story going in the fireplace. I really, I don't, don't really like it anymore. I loved it the first time around, but now and I'd even defend Tenant's terrible pretend drunk, not drunk acting, which is an awful scene in many respects. I don't know, Meg, where are you a bit? What do you think about, this is kind of connected, what do you think about Rose and the Doctor as a romantic relationship? Because I, I find it creepy as fuck. I don't buy it at all, I don't think. Thank you. I don't think. I don't get the hate that fandom has towards Tenant and Rose. That seems past reason hatred. I, I never got this idea that Rose big changes as a character in season two and that they're glad when she's gone. But I never really convinced by that relationship. I, I, I mean, I'm so old, I'm not really convinced about Doctor Companion relationships apart from maybe Romana. And of course, that's partly because Tom Baker was shagging Lala Ward at that point. Um, and so there's a bleed between the characters and, and the, the actors. But I, I don't, I don't know. I, I think Capaldi and River. I think, the I think end that's the best the... relationship they do. Yeah. And I think the fact that because it's 24 years and a single night because of how time works on that planet, I believe that. And the fact that then because they've got themselves into this nonsense of gap years and they're doing two episodes a year, you have him come back. I can believe that. But I don't, Amy, Clara, Clara and Capaldi, which we've spoken about briefly before and we'll talk about in more length. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the resolution of it in Hell Bent is amazing. I love Hell mm -hmm. Bent, and 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 it really does get to the heart that this is a weird, toxic relationship ultimately, and that this pushing of each other. But Rose and the Doctor, I, I never really got it. Martha pining after the Doctor, it just strikes me as a waste of that character, and that's why I think Freeman Agamemnon doesn't really get what she should get because I think Freeman Agamemnon is very good. But there, were the, there was an argument in, in a defunct magazine, I forgot what it was called, that they were going to have real trouble with season two. They'd been able to spend time working out season one, but season two, because they weren't sure they were going to get recommissioned, that, that was done on kind of the, the hoof. I think the problem, or actually I used to think the problem with season three, which I think is a bit of a dog out of those first four. I think, I think David's best season is the second half of four. And mm -hmm. it's got Science in the Library, which which for my money is Tennant's best performance when it, from off it. Oh, for, when he's playing the Doctor the first time, around, I, I think Science in the Library of His Run is, is an amazing story. I agree. And so the kind of the idea that, that Tennant might have stayed on for season five and done one season with Moffat, and it would have started with the Doctor dying and saying, you look like you're going to get sick. Maybe. <laughs> is it the idea of no Matt Smith for that fifth season? I'm kind of caught there. I, I would have liked to see Tennant for Moffat, but I would not not want Matt Smith because I love Matt Smith. Um, I think so. I because obviously, as I, as I keep saying, I started with Smith, so I went back to watch Tennant Nicholson. Yeah, admittance when I rewatched Doctor Who, I skipped 10 a lot of the time, which is really controversial. No, I can However, understand it. I also think that a lot of Tennant's charm is because of his attractiveness. Because he has, he's written, his doctor's written in such a cocky way that he can get away with. Because you can see the characters around him swooning. Yeah. And I think he gets away with it just because he's written to be charming as well most of the time. That wouldn't have worked with a different writer, I don't think. Because Muffat can just write these dorky men. I don't think he can, he can do speeches, sure. But so can Dan Harmon. So it's like, you know, I don't think you know who Dan Harmon is. I said that with a lot of oh, confidence. I'm <laughs> still thinking about the idea of 
tenant I think that's I think that's right actually because I, I find I, I find a lot of ten unwatchable now because the way they directed him to be this kind of shrill and shrieky and I don't know why they've stuck with the Mockney accent. Given that the line was dropped, that he's got that accent because he spent too long with Rose, this kind of a, a estuary rat. Um, and then when they come back for 14, I think Tennant's much better in the, what we just had. I think you can really see he's settled into the role because Tennant as an actor, I think has got better and better as he's gone on. And I think because Tennant himself seems to be a fundamentally decent figure, there's a lot he, you know, because he plays really horrible characters, you know, in 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 Kilgrave. Um, what's the most? Yeah, 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 even because before when his casting was announced, of course, um, ITV had um, Secret Smile in the can where he plays this rapist, and essentially his first line is, is watching that mouth, and I thought. I've come in that mouth. And I thought, well, well done, ITV. Well done. You're not bitter at all that um, this is trouncing you in the ratings. But it, Tenant gets away with it because, because it's Tenant. And it's a shame then that a lot of it is apples and pears, Carl Rose, aren't we having fun? Alon Z, let's shriek a bit. Aren't I skinny? And yeah. that's what it boils down to a lot of the time. Whereas I think Moffat makes, Moffat's scripts make him quiet. And, and when he does, still, he's really, really good. So there's a scene in, in the library where River whispers to him his name and he goes still. And he and he's because Ten's got a very expressive face as well. Mm. And like Matt Smith, I think I think I think in, in uh, the Big Bang when Matt Smith is in the Pandorica after he's been shot and the green yeah. light is on, it's an astonishing moment. And he looks so sad and so old and so worn out, and he's really, really good. And there are just so many good bits that you just want to punch the TV when, oh, look, here comes a, a Moffat sex woman. Isn't the, isn't the Doctor geeking funny and he can get away with this type of thing? So, yeah, I don't know. Who is Dan Harmon? That's a long way around. Oh, um, he's the writer of Community, but he's known now for doing Rick and Morty. Oh, yeah, I know what that is. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I, I so... turn it over. Exactly. So it's like Dan Harmon is known for doing these things called winger speeches where he's like it's this magnificent speech and it it brings the whole episode together and it's so great but just because you can write a speech doesn't mean you can write something good because this man is on like season 10 of Rick and Moy. it's like you don't you know what I mean like just because it connects the episode doesn't mean it's good yes if people listen people in the comments if people are watching this there is a community poster on my wall you're not allowed to be mad at me for not liking Dan Harmon but I just think if they get mad I will mute the comments so yeah <laughs> just be nice be, be kind of become a kind of cliche be nice and be constructive you don't be yeah. shit as well if you're funny don't just be abusive well I don't think we've been abusive to moth here the speech is an interesting point of course it's kind of a, a good point to 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 round up because we're going to do eight, nine, ten in a, in a second video. But the speeches and Capaldi—that's where a lot of the praise for that and a lot of the regret that it's not as good as it should be. There's a heart, yeah. You, know, you don't like Moffat, you don't like the relationship, but you love Capaldi, and Capaldi is awesome. Matt Smith I, is awesome. I fuck so hard with Capaldi just because of the thick of it. I must yeah. admit, it's because. Of oh, the I mean, we we're, were watching that live reveal of Capaldi and of course it leaks early in the day that's why the book had closed and I was unbelievably happy when Capaldi came out then he did his little clutch in the lapels and I thought oh shit we're in for trouble here because you know, <laughs> he remember, he's a long-term fan he tries to take over DWAS he, you've got a letter from Barry Letts yeah. he knows this off but long-term fans and the show being cast as the doctor it, you think of Colin Baker and it's a weird thing in that Moffat knows all this, Capaldi knows all this, and yet you end up essentially doing a retread of the worst excesses of Colin Baker's run. And I love Colin Baker, but if you haven't learned from the mistakes of Twin Dilemma in season 22, and then you repeat them in season eight, which I think they do, you've made a right mess of things here now, lads. And but it's, it's been building, we suggested it's, it's there. Yeah, I think it's interesting because um, I remember when Capaldi got announced because my we were out as a family, like us and our extended family, and my dad and I made us leave early so we could go home and get signal. Because I'm, I'm from Devon, so there's no signal out. So we made us leave early and go back to our best friend's house so we could like crawl over his little phone. It's like an iPhone 5, like just trying to watch this thing. And I remember got announced and we just went, oh, 
Oh, and we got very excited, then we got very concerned, like you said. It was like a, oh, but then, because I was like, this man can do a speech. The thick of it, I think this, obviously he carries the thick of it, he's the main character, but also just, he he demands a certain respect. And I think mm. that's what the Doctor needed after being made to play self-insert teenage boys. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yes, but the problem is if you then think your core audience is teenage boys, if you then cast a man who's 55, what effect does that have on, on the show? Um, and I think it's, you know, I love Capaldi. I think he made the best actor we ever had, but I'm not sure actually that casting was right for the show at the time. I agree with you. Yeah. Maybe. I'm really happy with what we got, but, but also... Yeah. How far... The decline was because people turned away from a speechifying man with, with white hair with a really consistent characterization. Mm. I think there's three different versions of the of the 12th Doctor there. Um, in a way that we don't get three different versions of Matt Smith, what we get is Matt Smith, a kind of pallid copy of Matt Smith, and then back to Matt Smith again towards the end, but it's it's all a bit bit too late. Um, Sorry, I just remember but, the well, episode um, Dinosaurs on a Spaceship. And I was like, oh, oh yeah. Happy. Just, Chip was, North. Yeah. It's like at Chip. least we didn't have to touch on that. And but does have a really, really terrible sex joke in it as well about uh, rifles and about Cleopatra. And you were left thinking, I'm not, yeah, I'm not censorious, but I don't know really that's what your young audience because I think they've they've lost sometimes the view that they're they're the perfect age for watching Doctor Who as I think Ben Arimich suggested years ago was eight or nine. That's when you start watching it. That's when it, if you it grabs you and, and you you with it for, for life. Um, you'd seem surprised at that. Maybe you're about yeah. four or five when you start to watch. No, That's I fine. Just... My my six. Good for them. I think um, I I think the your agenda has to affect when you start watching Doctor Who, because if I couldn't yeah. think critically about what I was watching at the time, I wouldn't have liked it because yes. I wouldn't have been able to get over the jokes. Yes. Yes. Which Whereas of course, I... there's then a discussion about how far Jodie Whittaker then uh, attracts the same age group, but but um, but girls. I don't think um, she did. I really don't think she changed it. And I yeah, there's statistics I think... going against me, but I. There might be someone watching this who's got those stats to hand, and so if you want to drop them into the comments box, please we'll do. Them, I will but, respond. But really interesting to see whether there is whether the the um the gender of the audience changes when Jodie Whittaker I think you're right I don't think it does change and I do wonder if that's because an idea of what the show is is fixed during Moffat's run and does it even with Capaldi being cast and some really interesting changes certainly in season 10 that is too late to shift that shift it in any other direction but we'll see Oh, that's a perfect point to pause there. May it's have a cliffhanger and pointing forward to where we're going next, which is to Capaldi, probably back to Matt Smith again, because you've got a bit of Matt Smith love, but Capaldi in those those three seasons. Mm. And then maybe we we won't it won't be out by that point, but there is a Moffat episode coming. So we'll have to, we'll have to do a, a a postscript to this when we see what Don't Moffat's doing. Threaten for me with that, Paul. <laughs> oh, no, be <laughs> established. That he's great as a single yeah. one-off writer, but also all the problems are there, mm. and they're going to be just exaggerated once he's got in control and he's got a whole season to play it. But we'll see. So on that note, we will leave you, dear viewers. Hopefully, more than one, and um, yeah, we'll have to set the date for the part two, Nick. And yes. I'm gonna I'm gonna stop the recording. They know my usual skill. <laughs>